Good afternoon to everyone here today. I would like to greet the delegation of the state of Peru and the representation of the elect victims. I declare this public hearing open, case 13.572, Mashkopiro, Yora, and Amawaka peoples regarding Peru. I inform the parties that they have the English to Spanish translation option. You can click on the globe icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. I will give the floor to the Deputy Executive Secretary, Jorge Mesa, to present the case. Thank you, Mr. President. This case relates to the elect responsibility of the state for a series of actions and omissions that jeopardize the survival and physical, spiritual, and cultural integrity of the indigenous peoples in isolation, initial content, Mashkopiro, Yora, Amahuaca, in region Madre de Dios, Cusco, Ucayali, in Peru. On April 2018, the Commission notified the parties of the application of Article 36.3 of Rules of Procedure, given that the petition is including the criteria established in Resolution 116, and the, uh, decided on admissibility referred until the debate decision on the merits. The hearing will be listened by the plenary in order to listen to the statements of two witnesses, deepen the arguments of admissibility and merits of the parties and receive information on the current status of the case. I will give back the floor to Mr. President. Thank you. The commission will hear the statement of Daniel Rodriguez as witness offered by the petitioning party. Mr. Rodriguez will testify about the alleged threats faced by the Mashkopiro, Yora, and Amahuaca peoples, the alleged lack of implementation of protection policies and measures by the states, and the alleged adoption of actions that uh, hinder the principle of no contact of the peoples in this case. The petitioning party will have up to 10 minutes to carry out the interrogation. Subsequently, the state may question the witness for 10 minutes. Finally, the commission will ask witness uh, the witness questions. Mr. Witness, please say your full name, place of birth, and place of residence. My name is Daniel Rodriguez Fernandez. I'm from Spain and I live in Peru. I will also ask you, do you swear or promise to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I will now give the floor to the petitioners so that you can carry out your interrogation. Thank you. Mr. Commissioner, good afternoon to everyone. I am Juliana Bravo. I will carry out the interrogation. Good afternoon, Daniel. Could you please explain what are the risks faced by the peoples and the consequences of third parties in the Piazzi territory? Yes, regarding this issue, I could like to mention some elements about this uh, complex problem that has been developed for two decades. Firstly, I would like to say that these peoples, as other indigenous people in isolation, are vulnerable. Mainly, the main characteristic of this group of peoples that are related to uh, they are prone to infectious disease that may be uh, due to an external contact with third parties. There are numerous cases of epidemics that have killed these people throughout history. And we have the case of the Nawa who have been contacted in the 80s, mid 80s in due to the proximity of the region of Madre de Dios and 60% of the population died. Also, these peoples is vulnerable because it's a community who's, who do not have a permanent 
uh, place of residence and they carry out agricultural activities. They depend on the resources of the forest, which they gather um, moving around a broad territory. They are vulnerable uh, to environmental impact under and the ecological conditions of the forest that may affect their livelihoods. The question regarding risks, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't know if you can turn your camera on. We cannot see you. I am sorry. Of course. I'm sorry. You can continue now. I wanted to say that the risk of the presence of third parties, these causes an increase of risk of uh, contagion and hostile encounter and also alter the conditions of the forest on which they depend. There's a series of dimensions that are uncertain that cannot be estimated at in certain circumstances, it was possible to see that they had to move around due to the presence of third parties, causing these um, peoples to move. Uh, and these may affect other actors and other indigenous peoples. Invasion to their territory may attract have an reverse effect attract with because of the aim of controlling who these people invading the territory are and maybe it calls the attention because of different tools or elements that may be of interest these people is in a situation of extreme vulnerability since 2011, when they became visible in certain sectors in the region of Madre de Dios, creating a situation of emergency that is permanent in this region. They were close to inhabited places. This has caused conflict with a third party persons, the risk of contact and also uh, several persons who try to get close to them. The situation of vulnerability is increased because of the lack of protection to their territories in different uh, sectors where these people live, where they carry out, where there are illegal activities such as illegal logging, drug trafficking activities. This affects the peoples and the activity of uh, companies that work ille in legal way when these persons live. Um, also the development of mega projects, for example, the road in Cusco Madre de Dios that could affect the south part of this territory to connect this area with areas in which uh, mining activities are carried out, among other activities. And finally, I could like to say that the political vulnerability of these peoples in Peru, there are cases in which the defenders are being criminalized. Thank you, Daniel. Taking into account the principle of no contact, what is the effect uh, of uh, logging concessions operating in this sector. The principle of protection of peoples in isolation, it considers it's a human right and a strategy of survival in order to preserve their life and their autonomy. This principle is associated to the intentability of the territories. It implies identifying the areas where they are and implementing the effective protection measures to prevent the access or uh, entrance of external persons. In the context of the categorization of these reserve, it is proposed to create active uh, reserves with um, that are called reserves with peoples and the possibility of harmonizing rights between concessions and the right to life 
of peoples in isolation and also the possibility of controlling and dealing with situations of risk through contingency plans. This kind of proposal goes against the principle of no contact because it does not repair the intangibility of the territory and it could cause a situation of constant risk and it could have a, an effect on the situation of and the different uh, protection measures that exist in Madre de Dios. There are different security uh, passages and taking this into account, it couldn't be possible to monitor uh, situations of risk or prevent them from happening uh, or affecting the peoples in isolation due to contacts. This is a very dangerous situation at the level of the continent. There's a consensus in connection to the implementation of protection based on the principle of no contact, based on intangibility. Finally, you have mentioned this. The Peruvian state has established that the implementation of contingency plans is an effective measure for the protection of the Piazzi peoples. Based on your experience, could you explain how these contingency plans work in Peru and whether they can guarantee the principle of no contact? These plans are specific instruments that establish a series of procedures so that external actors um, can respond to different scenarios that may arise with uh, peoples in isolation, such as the finding of evidence and situations of uh, physical proximity. Basically, the contingency plans are to prevent uh, contact or conflict. These contingency plans are developed based on previous experiences and a series of um, elements based on the principle of no contact, and it's the implementation of common sense, which is to uh, do not come close to these peoples. These are guiding principles, but do not guarantee the fact that it may be a contact with isolation peoples that could lead to dangerous situations for both parties. So we need to think that these kind of situations are high risk situations in which both parties are in a situation of tension is quite unpredictable so to know what's going to happen and we have numerous situations uh, that set an example regarding this practice in the region so Contingency plans should be understood as instruments, complementary instruments as to the main measure of protection that is to guarantee the non, the intangibility of the peoples. We have reached the time uh, uh, you will have more time when it comes to final conclusions. I will now give the floor to the representation of the state for 10 minutes so that they can carry out their interrogation. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I would like to greet once again all of you. Based on the fact that we have more questions of the petitioners, we would like to ask Mr. Rodriguez to reply briefly. We need, uh, we have questions that are very specific and we ask him to reply briefly. Mr. Rodriguez, first question that is very important to point out whether you have or have a labor relation with FENAMAL and for how long you worked or have worked with FENAMAL. Yes, I work as an advisor of FENAMAL and I started my relation, working relation in 2003 as a volunteer, and in different periods, I work as part of the team, the staff. Thank you. Could you say whether you have provided advisory to any indigenous organization within the FIASI? 
if that is the case, for how long? Of the Piazzi Commission? Could you clarify that? The commission in charge of the recategorization. Yes, my participation in that process has been as an advisor uh, for FENEMAD that is not a member of that commission. I fed FENEMAD is part of that. Yes, in connection to your previous um, response, do you know the report on the commission uh, regarding uh, indigenous peoples in a situation of self-isolation of 2014? Do you know that report? Yes. Por favor, para que sí, responda. Sí. sí. Yes. No sé si me, se me escucha. Sí. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. I think that I have an internet connection. Based on that affirmative answer, in this report, among recommendations, there is a recommendation too that points out. I can read it if you don't know it. It says that when there are current uh, tenders or concessions, such as logging concessions, the state has to review them for their modification. But the commission says that modification over time. Do you agree with that observation made by the commission? Well, I understand that the protection of peoples in isolation, especially in contexts in which there are persons suffering from activities of high impact in those territories and several situations, events of high risk that have been uh, recorded by several organizations, I believe that the implementation of measures is urgent. Thank you. That is a question to follow up with your previous uh, declaration. Based on you what you have mentioned as advisor of FENAMAD and the fact that you participated in, in the commission FIASI that we have mentioned, I would like to know if you were aware of the fact that in 2021, indigenous organizations in 19 February and in April requested time to assess this proposal. Are you aware of that? Yes, I'm aware of that. During that period, 2019, 2021, do you believe that that period was enough? I don't understand the goal of the question. I can rephrase it. There was a request in 2019, 2021, so that indigenous communities could uh, thoroughly analyze the proposals that had been made. You said that uh, you knew about this, that you knew about this uh, period. Do you believe that that time period is enough for the assessment of indigenous communities? I believe that there are inconsistencies in connection with this process of recategorization in which there is in fact an original proposal of recategorization approved by the commission and afterwards this was changed or modified somehow introducing a new proposal of recategorization that would allow companies to keep on operating until the end of their concession contract. I would like to ask you whether you know there are three proposals that are being debated. They were presented in 2019 and they are still being analyzed by organizations. I'm not going to speak 
about that because there are more important questions. I would like to know if in your experience as advisor, did you know that in July 27, 20, the representatives of the indigenous community did not participate and that this was uh, delayed. Did you know about that? I believe so. Thank you. Taking into account the urgency of the RICAT organization, we all agree on that. Do you think it is necessary that in order to vote for these three possibility, you have mentioned one of them, the one made by the Ministry of Culture, for this decision making, is it necessary for 15 members to uh, vote or that is not necessary? I'm sorry, please do not inter, if you're going to interrupt, please bear in mind the time. I'm sorry, I think that the question doesn't have to do with the declaration. They are talking about an internal process. So the representative of the state should take this into account when it comes to asking this question. One moment, uh, the time is uh, going on. So please, the state should be very specific about their questions. You have two minutes and 48 seconds. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to have the extra 30 seconds that the representatives of the petitioners have. I will try to be um, more specific. I would like to know if you consider that the decision on the recategorization should be done as soon as possible, uh, if possible, over this year. Do you think this is necessary? Yes, it's necessary. Thank you. One last question. Mr. Rodriguez, are you aware of the actions of coordination between the FENAMAT, the Ministry of Culture, to monitor and patrol the bases, uh, the basins of the reserve. Uh, if you say yes, I would thank you. If you could tell us the actions that are being developed. Yes, I am aware. Um, a monitoring work is being conducted in strategic sectors uh, based on a protection system. And these actions imply monitoring, threat identification, and also response to contingencies that may occur. Commissioner, you are on mute. Sorry, thank you, Commissioner. I would like to know whether the state has any other questions. No, Commissioner. We have more questions, but we won't have enough time. And in order to comply with the time that we've been assigned, we will stop here. Okay, thank you so much. So now we will have 20 minutes in which the Commission will be asking questions. And for that, we will follow the next order. I would like to know whether Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena de Troitinho, Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples, if she has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner and Chair of this hearing. I would respectfully greet the parties, the petitioners of this proceeding and the representatives of the state of Peru. I have two questions and I hope I can ask them to the witness. First, in this context, even during the questions of the state, uh, as an expert, what actions do you think that are the most dangerous and which actions do you think that could affect the principle of no contact of these indigenous peoples? That is my first question. 
And I have another question. The measures that you consider necessary, fundamental, that the state should conduct in order to repair the damage and the impacts and the risks that this situation of contact with third parties and the violation of the principle of no contact. What are the actions the state should take to repair in order to protect these indigenous peoples in isolation and initial contact? Well, it's a complex question. Um, I want to make a comment regarding these people. It's one of the most emblematic peoples in isolation. There are 185 isolated peoples across the continent, and this is one of the most emblematic peoples because they occupy a huge territory. Uh, this includes three regions in Peru and also the border with Brazil. So there is a lot of diversity and there are different situations of risk. Um, we are focusing on a sector of that territory that is the area of jurisdiction of the petitioner, FENAMAT. As I mentioned before, uh, the situation faced by these people is um, special situation. These people has hidden until 2011. There were no pictures. There was some evidence or indirect evidence, but as of 2011, these people moved to other parts of Madre de Dios region, and there are new emergency situations that occur, and you have to respond all the time to those situations of emergency. Uh, we don't know the reasons why this happened. Maybe we need to see what happened towards the end of the 90s and, or from the 90s until 2007. There was a decade in which several people invaded their territory. And over that decade, during which Penamat promoted the protection of territories, the development of protection methodologies, um, the presence of logging companies and the violations of rights probably influence the situation and lead to the situation that we are seeing right now. So we need to understand things in context. This is the history of a people. That is what's at stake and what's going to happen from now on. So what we need is protection. As I said before, we are talking about reference instruments such as contingency plans. There are some general guiding protocols about how to respond to these situations of contact. Uh, for example, in a part of Madre de Dios in 2011, a group of these people made travels to another part and they started to have contact with third parties. And that is a different situation because how can you handle that situation? Do you talk to them or not? Are they in isolation or they don't want to be in isolation? So local communities understand that when these peoples are visible is because they want to establish contact. So in those situations, there are sometimes several deaths in those encounters. Masco Piro peoples are interested in having access to some tools, or some goods, or sometimes they are curious, but they don't want to leave isolation. So 
How can we understand this in terms of public policies? What they are demanding from us is to take a step back and try to understand what's happening. The key element in that relationship, because you have a distance relationship with us. So the way in which we should react to the circumstances, which are unusual, imply creating protection corridors. It's necessary to implement measures so that in this complex situation, risks do not increase. And for that, we need to protect the territories. If the organizations and the state uh, working in the field, we know that this is complicated and very expensive. And if the state identifies that there are areas in which these peoples are present, the goal is for people not to be there. Um, we are talking about territorial representation, but we need to think that these peoples are vulnerable to diseases. So we need to protect these areas in terms of health so as to mitigate the possibility of the spread of diseases. And if they exist, maybe you should be able to react. Sorry to interrupt, but there are several questions we who want to ask questions. So please be as specific as possible when you answer our questions. I would thank you so much, Mr. Rodriguez. And I would like to know if Commissioner Joel Hernandez has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pre Mr. Chair. I just want to ask the witness whether he is aware of points of agreement with the state on the risk faced by these peoples and what are the risks that both parties consider that exist? Well, in some areas, we work together through the Control Post Network promoted by indigenous organizations since 2015. The state is present in those posts. So within this context, there are several monitoring work and identification work to identify these isolated peoples in order to protect them and to protect those areas. The protection of these territories and protection systems should occur across the whole territory. But the state uses protection mechanisms that do not cover the whole territory. And if the territory is not protected as a whole and there are spaces in which economic activities and extractive activities and persons are present there. What is protected on one side is not protected on the other and the risk remain there. So that's what I could say. Thank you. I would like to ask Commissioner Roberta Clark if she would like to ask any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Alon, and good afternoon to everyone. And to Mr. Rodriguez, I have uh, two, two or three questions. Uh, in, your, in your testimony, you spoke about um, the need for protection of people in isolation, especially where there are high high impact activities, I think is what you said. And so I want to ask you, are you aware of uh, whether or not the state undertook any of these protection um, mechanisms uh, which would have been needed? And if they, and if they did, um, what, what were the measures taken? What were the protection measures taken? And what, uh, with what impact? So that's my first question. 
Secondly, I wanted to ask, are there any exceptions to the no contact um, uh, for people in isolation? Um, and then thirdly, uh, if the, the usage of the territory is not exclusive, what are the conditions, the legal and legitimate conditions under which third parties can have access to the territories? And in that regard, um, have, the, have the affected communities been consulted? Sorry, the first question. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have written. The... Sure. Yeah. The first question. First question. You spoke about the need for protection of peoples in isolation yeah. where there are high impact activities. Yes. And I'm asking you, are you aware of any protection mechanisms or measures that have been undertaken by the state? And if so, what were these measures and with what impact? Right. The problem is that there hasn't been like a proper uh, measures taken uh, even when you know this uh, a way, a wide uh, document widely documented uh, evidences of the impacts particularly uh, logging companies and they uh, you know operating in some sectors of the territory um, uh, building roads uh, and bringing uh, 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 loads of uh, workers who are also uh, in, in, you know, in danger as well, you know, and um, these, this kind of activities are, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite complicated for an indigenous organization in such a, a huge territory to uh, document what happens and particularly when there's, uh, you know, uh, areas where uh, structures operate in, in conditions of illegality because it's very dangerous and also uh, in, you know inside concessions because you know it's you know you're not allowed to go inside mm -hmm. of, of those areas uh, but now we have satellite uh, technology and the Peruvian government has in its own platform uh, you know uh, uh, you know the, the information that of the high impact of this um, of these activities actually uh, in areas that have been identified by the and uh, acknowledged by officially acknowledged by the Peruvian state of the presence of these of these peoples so actually this this, this that's one of the the weakness um you know and and, and leaves us with a question if if uh, uh, if the authorities are investing uh, you know resources and effort in protecting some some part of the territories, why uh, when there's also information that these high impact activities are being, uh, you know, uh, implemented, uh, in, and, and there's no action taken, and that's also very, uh, um, you know, that, that's that's an important question to ask. So you're saying you said that no proper measures, but I just want to get a sense of what kind of measures, whether they they are of no consequence or not. Uh, is there anything that the state is doing to protect? I understand you're saying that's of little impact, but mm -hmm. I just want to have a sense of what were the measures being undertaken? Well, the first, the first measure is that uh, once the territory of, of, uh, of the uh, indigenous people in isolation is uh, identified, it should apply uh, the uh, measures to secure those territories from the presence of others. And particularly high impact, uh, you know, activities. Mm -hmm. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Thank you so much. I would like to ask Commissioner Carlos Bernal if she, if he has any questions. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to second a part of the question made by Ms. Clark. Uh, and is the following, the measure of no contact, if you think that it's a right, it's an absolute right. And to begin with, there should be no exceptions to that no contact right. But at the same time, it's very difficult to enforce this right because you have to enforce it even against the will of indigenous peoples in isolations because sometimes they are curious they want to be out and sometimes they establish some contact with some people 
So I have two questions. One uh, has to do with Commissioner Clark. Do you think that there are justified exceptions to the principle of no contact? And which are the risks for the community? As secondly, I would like to know if there are any alternatives to no contact. For example, uh, it could be the creation of regulations in order to mitigate risk for the health of indigenous peoples. I know that there are also psychological risks uh, as described in the report from 2013. So what protocols should be implemented by the state? Um, what we want to do is, because it's very difficult to implement a military monitoring in such a huge territory. So I would like to know what alternative measures could be taken. Thank you. Okay, well, actually, the principle is the protection of life and integrity, and there's no other way of protecting that, the lives of these peoples that avoid in contact. It's like that, in case there is contact, situations may arise and they may be catastrophic for these people. That is our experience. And taking that into account, I mean, from the perspective of protection, to negotiate the right to life doesn't make sense with negotiate that with economic rights from the point of view of protection it is necessary to implement a series of measures to prevent contact and respect the right of self-determination of that people they have to decide by their own without external uh, participation so that what always happens does not happen. Public policies in the continent has been to attract them, offering them tools, objects to subdue them so that new territories can be open to development. Based on that, the principle of no contact is a public policy in Brazil in the 80s, and it is a public policy established by the government. The indigenous organizations of Peru are incorporated, and for two decades, we have tried for that to be a public policy. Of course, I understand the context of the question. We are talking about a context in which economic borders make progress towards the end of the world where resources are. The Mascopiro territory since mid 90s was affected by um, an increase in the production of mahogany and there's a process of progress of illegal activities and colonization in this territory from the perspective of the protection of human rights the question is that it cannot be negotiated and that's a challenge that's why somehow we are fighting for that Thank you. We have now reached our time. We would like to thank the witness. And now we will hear the statement of Mahed Velasquez as witness offered by the Peruvian state. Mr. Velasquez will testify on the recategorization procedure of the Madre de Dios Territorial Reserve there is a microphone that is open. Thank you. 
Mr. Velasquez will testify on the recategorization procedure on the Madre de Dios Territorial Reserve and the actions that the Ministry of Culture is carrying out in favor of the protection of indigenous peoples in voluntary isolation that inhabit the Madre de Dios Territorial Reserve. The state will have 10 minutes to carry out the interrogation. Subsequently, the petitioning party will have 10 minutes and the commission will also have time to ask questions. Please, I ask you to be as brief as possible. I will now give the floor to the state. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr. Maher Velasquez. I will now ask you some questions in connection to this case. What actions have been implemented through the Ministry of Culture for the protection of the Piazzi population? Good afternoon, representatives and commissioners. Since 2011, until now, the Peruvian state through the Ministry of Culture has been implementing policies and measures for the protection of Piazzi's peoples. Among main measures are related to these topics, territorial protection, a specific legislation for the protection of the Piazzi, new requests for the creation of uh, indigenous reserves, and the development of alliances with uh, native communities, indigenous communities within their framework for the protection of the Piazzi peoples. I would like to say that the Peruvian state has recategorized seven indigenous communities in the uh, region of Cusco, Madre Dios, Ucayali, and Loreto that encompass a surface that accounts for 3.2% of the national territory and acknowledged uh, officially 20 indigenous peoples in a situation of isolation and initial contact. In connection with the territories of Piazzi indigenous peoples, Mascopiro, Mahuaca, and Yora, the Ministry of Culture has carried out several actions which I'm going to mention in Madre de Dios, implementation of training programs for the agents uh, that are in charge of the protection and the development of a multi-sectoral uh, group to implement urgent measures for these peoples that live or move around in areas that are not uh, re uh, indigenous reserves, among other actions. Taking that into account, could you say which spaces of coordination the Ministry of Culture has with the representatives of indigenous community leaders. The Peruvian state through the Ministry of Culture has strengthened these spaces of coordinations with indigenous communities involved in the defense of the Piazzi. This can be seen in the joint efforts on field and between agents of protection and members of the Ministry of Culture and members of the uh, Federation of Madre de Dios in the main basins to, of access to the reserves to prevent third parties from accessing these territories or those who may pose a threat. Thus, we guarantee the right of representative of indigenous peoples through the actions the state carries out to protect the Piazzi. Thank you. In line with the previous questions, could you say which are the functions of a surveillance post uh, in Piazzi territories? Yes. In order to guarantee the protection of the Piazzi territory, the Ministry of Culture has um, 15 uh, surveillance posts that are uh, strategically located in the main basins that provide access to the reserves. They have been increased over time. Through the Ministry of Culture, we will build four more surveillance posts within the reserves that were created in 2021. And during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the Ministry of Culture has strengthened the equipment of surveillance posts, uh, improving our operational capacity. Also, surveillance posts that have been implemented have 57 agents. I'm sorry. Yes. Who spoke Juliana Bravo on behalf of the petitioners. Mr. Commissioner, I would like to make a comment. The rule of the commission says that witnesses could not read. So 
uh, I feel that Mr. that the witness is reading. So I would like to ask the commissioner to ask the witness not to read. What the petition is saying is okay, but if there is not, we don't have any evidence that he is reading. Uh, it is only that he's aware of the questions that are being asked. We understand the recommendations, but the state does not um, share that view. I'd like to stop the time. As long as there are specific answers, specific uh, questions, we can carry out the interrogatory so let us continue so we can respect the time. I do not have every, any evidence of what has been said. So I, as I have said, please ask brief questions and answer briefly. We were interrupted while doing the question, so I will ask the witness to continue with his declaration. 57 protection agencies uh, carry out these uh, surveillance and carry out monitoring activities. These agents aim at coordinating with local authorities and with indigenous communities, um, they carry out an important uh, labor of coordination with local health authorities. In this case, the protection agents participate in different preventive measures and medical attention for uh, peoples um, of self-isolation and initial contact. Thank you. Within the framework of the previous question, I would like you to explain what other actions apart from surveillance posts have been implemented to benefit the elect victims. In connection with the Mascopira, Mahuaca and Yara communities, the Ministry of Culture has the authority to protect this community and coordinates actions with competent public entities and with FENAMAD and it has established measures to guarantee the rights and the Ministry of Culture since 2011 until now has developed different measures, such as coordination with Ministry of Health and for the medical attention of the peoples and um, neighboring communities with the goal the, the connection has been cut. Thank you. I'm going to interrupt you to keep on asking the rest of the questions. Talking about recategorization that has been mentioned before, what information do you have about the actions that the FIASI um, in charge of recategorization Madre, of Madre de Dios has implemented? The Ministry of Culture, as it presides Piazzi has summoned ordinary meetings in order to establish a roadmap such as the expansion of the Madre de Dios Territorial Reserve. In June 2021, we had the last ordinary meeting. We have not reached a consensus with all members of the multi-sectoral members together with the decision-making process of the commission of the ministry and regarding uh, different measures that have to be implemented at national and local level. Thus, the recategorization has not been reached. However, the Ministry of Culture continues to implement uh, protection measures for uh, these uh, indigenous peoples. And in the second semester of this year, we will try to keep on negotiating to find a better solution for the protection of the Madre de Dios Territorial Reserve. So I'm going to conclude with this question, thanking your participation. This is connected with the participation of FENAMAL. In this case, the organization you are part of as part of this commission, the 
IDE, IDC. So what's the level of participation they have had in the last decisions they, that have been made within this commission? Thank you. Within the framework of the commission and the session of the commission, the Ministry of Culture in 2021, in March, although it had uh, shared the different documents that made up the file for recategorization, the indigenous communities that make up FENAMA said they lack sufficient information to make uh, that decision as members of the commission. Thus, the request of indigenous organizations Um, we decided to postpone the session for uh, 15 days in order uh, for these communities to um, keep on assessing the documents. The ministry summoned the communities and organizations for an informative meeting, but they did not participate. Thank you. We are going to conclude now. I would like you to mention what different measures you mentioned the surveillance post, what measures have been implemented for the benefit of the elect victims. In connection to the approval of the attention plan for the Mascopira Mawakayora uh, people and the development of a multi sectoral group. And within the framework of control and surveillance, we have carried out four monitoring um, processes in order to, and different surveillance actions in order to identify threats around the territories. Mr. Commissioner, as we want to uh, comply with the uh, time that we have, um, I would like to thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Now the petitioners will have 10 minutes to carry out the interrogation, taking into account the observation during their previous interrogation. I would like to remind you that the rules of procedure establish that witnesses cannot read their statements before the commission as we're in a virtual uh, a space, I cannot say whether the witness is reading, but it would be very helpful for us to ask very brief questions and for you to answer in a very specific and succinct manner. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr deponent and following what the representative of the state said, they were talking about the process of recategorization and the participation of indigenous communities. I would like to know, FENAMAD presented a letter in May 2021 pointing out some reasons why they did not participate in the meeting uh, because there's, I would like to know the response of the state to that specific letter and to this process of broad participation so that it is rigorous and that is uh, informed participative process. The question is leading to an answer. I think that it should be shorter. I would like to know what's the reply of the uh, uh, state in connection with that letter. So we summoned indigenous communities so they could be informed in March that year. And it was not possible to carry out this meeting with their participation. Afterwards, we have tried the way of establishing communication or finding these channels of consensus so that we are able to know and identify three proposals 
they have been analyzed by the multisectoral commission in this case the commission is in charge of making decisions and that is not the role of the ministry of culture in a unilateral way the ministry does not decide what measures should be implemented it's very important to highlight that as we have mentioned the work carried out between indigenous communities and the ministry of culture has been carried out with constant communication and this has also been uh, it can be seen by this monitoring and surveillance but we have not concluded this process and we need to keep these channels to guarantee the protection of these indigenous peoples in a situation of isolation. Thank you. Can you tell the commission how this multisectorial commission is made up? Yes, it is made up of members of the state of Peru and members of civil society, which are represented by indigenous organizations. How many indigenous organizations participate in the commission? ISEPT and CONAP. Those are the two rep organizations representing indigenous peoples, the two organizations only at a national level. Yes, yes, only those two organizations. Thank you. I have another question. With regard to the process of recategorization of the Reserve Madre de Dios, the state has recognized the presence of the Piazzi peoples outside the reserve, especially in the areas where logging concessions have been granted. So the Ministry of Culture has mentioned this figure of recategorization. And we would like to know if this proposal of recategorization would guarantee uh, that there are no encounters with third parties. I would like to mention the report on the Inter-American Court on Indigenous Peoples in Isolation and Initial Contact. In item 14, the court recommends that in these cases, when there are concessions to conduct commercial activities, when there are, the, when there are Indigenous Peoples in Isolation, the concessions could be modified to guarantee the respect of the rights of, of indigenous peoples. Taking into consideration this paragraph and the national legislation, especially law 29763 on the law on forests, the law indicates that the respect of the human rights of indigenous peoples in isolation should be guaranteed when it comes to concessions. And also, institutions such as the National Authority of Forests and the Regional Forest Institution should adequate those concessions if there is a situation that could affect indigenous peoples in a situation of initial contact. So the measure has promoted a set of measures aimed at what you are talking about. Uh, that is the protection of uh, the principle of no contact and guarantee the life and the survival of indigenous peoples in initial contact. This is what the state of Peru is trying to do. And our legislation, the law 28763 um, accounts for this and mentions in a very specific way the principle of no contact and the need to protect and safeguard the lives of indigenous peoples in isolation. Thank you, Mr. Witness. Could you explain the legal reasons of the proposal of the state of Peru with regard to the creation of indigenous reserves, taking into consideration the logging activities within the reserve? The legal reason of indigenous reserves is established in the law on indigenous peoples in isolation. 
it's aimed at creating a territory mechanism to guarantee the people's survival and to protect them from any type of vulnerability that they could suffer if they are encountered or they if they are approached by third parties so that's a legal framework and the position of the ministry of culture is to follow those standards which are related to international treaties in the matter and indigenous peoples. And also there is several legislation and jurisprudence to guarantee the survival of these peoples. We give them a specific treatment. But with regard to the legal reasons, how the state of Peru explains the the uh, that there is no conflict between logging concessions and the rights of indigenous peoples. Why you talk about compatibility of logging concessions and the protection of indigenous peoples in isolation? Well, our regulations, our legislation establishes that indigenous reserves are intangible and no economic activity can be conducted there. No extractivist activity can be conducted there. And that is established in law. And we protect these peoples, or we seek to protect these peoples in any situation that may arise. As a Ministry of Culture and as the State of Peru, that is what we are trying to do. And That's why we were quoting the report of the Inter-American Commission on Indigenous Peoples in Isolation. And also we have our legislation and we have listed the changes in concessions that should be done. So how can you explain this um, mechanism of recategorization? What we are doing our proposal is based, it is a proposal that should be agreed by the multi-sectorial commission. It is a proposal that should be assessed by indigenous organizations and peoples. And the proposal is aimed at protecting, protecting indigenous peoples very soon because the creation of the reserve would help to implement some protection mechanisms. This includes the protection plan that will promote the articulation of different services and institutions that participate in the network. Sorry. Thank you. We are running out of time. So I thank you, the witness and the petitioner. Now I would like to give the floor to the commissioners for their questions. Uh, Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples, Commissioner Rosemena, do you have any questions? I have one single question so that my colleagues have time to ask questions. Thank you so much for all the information. In this case, the case that we are addressing today at this hearing, I would like to know if the witness could me could give me some details. In these procedures of recategorization that have occurred in different ways, not all these recategorizations have been the same. Could you explain the reasons that you have taken into consideration so that not all the territories in the area are recognized as Piazza's territories. Why not all the territories are considered indigenous reserves? Why these territories are categorized in different ways? And I would like to know 
how you are trying to guarantee the benefits and the protection for these reserves, uh, which are, I don't know how to say this, they are not reserves as such or specific reserves, but I would like to know why there are these differences between territories. And I would like to know if there is any possibility that soon that these territories can be recognized as indigenous reserves as such, taking into consideration the principle of intangibility that you have mentioned before. And you told us that this process is still going on, it's not completed, although it began in 2011. So that's what I would like to know, the context uh, to understand the different categories that are, are that exist out there. You are on mute, Mr. Witness. Thank you. I would like to explain this to you. The study on recategorization is conducted by a third party. And the third party conducts this study based on some delimitation criteria. This is done based on three studies conducted, taking into consideration legal, environmental, and anthropological aspects. When this final study is conducted, um, the authorities define the limits of the reserve. And this is the same process for any indigenous reserve. And this is what we did for this additional recategorization uh, process. And the members of the sectorial commission agreed to this delimitation. I believe that your question is about the situation of these three options or proposals about how to determine the category of the territories based on the final decision on the limitation. So the state of Peru, the Ministry of Culture to be more specific, provided uh, proposed this recategorization that I mentioned before. We are basing our work and report 2014 from the court in recommendation 14 that it has to do with the right to create a reserve because the creation of the reserve will help us apply instruments that are necessary taking into consideration the threats that exist and that occur permanently in our state. One of those mechanisms is the protection plan that is a management tool that will help us to articulate our work with different sectors in order to guarantee the protection of indigenous peoples and to guarantee the protection of this huge area in order to promote also the health um, corridors in there so as to avoid any tragedy in this population. Also, we are thinking about the creation of a management commission made up of different organizations that will monitor the implementation of this plan. These and other protection mechanisms will support the creation of the reserve in order to safeguard and to make sure that these peoples can survive. And what the state of Peru feels is that these public uh, policies should be a priority and should be implemented as soon as possible. Thank you. I would like to ask Commissioner Joel Hernandez if he would like to ask any questions. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a specific question. In what year do you begin with the recategorization procedure of Madre de Dios Reserve and why this process is not completed yet? 
2013, in, to, in 2003, sorry. And the reasons, as I was saying before, have to do with the consensus, not about the category study, but also because of the lack of consensus on the um, final decision. How, that is how this study will be conducted. There are three proposals. The proposal Uh, there is one of the proposals that in the that is the creation or, or the that a regional government should determine the spaces or the territories that include these logging concessions. We have ruled out this proposal due to the regulations and the legislation that has been developed. The second proposal had to do with excluding immediately the concessions from the territory. And this is something that goes beyond the capacity of the multi-sectorial commission. The multi-sectorial commission cannot make those decisions. They cannot exclude concessions from a territory. And the third proposal is what the proposal of the state, that is the creation or the amplifying the reserve with concessions. Uh, this proposal is supported by the report of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights from 2014. In paragraph 14, you have the support. And this proposal is also aligned with the forest law, with the law on indigenous peoples that we have in Peru. And also it is aligned with other regulations. And when there is an overlapping of concessions and indigenous concessions should be excluded based on the decisions made by the two organizations of the state that work in uh, forest concessions. This is a regional forest authority and the national forest authority. In 2003, when the reserve was created and in 2015, 2016, we conducted that additional study to consider amplifying or extending this reserve. Thank you. Commissioner Roberta Clark would like to ask any questions. Yes, just one question. Thank okay. you very much. Um, you spoke about a range of protection policies and programs, including legislation, territorial protection, training of of, of, of uh, people who do the surveillance. Um, can you tell us what impact these measures have had to uh, secure the protection of the indigenous peoples in isolation and whether or not you get uh, these protection measures including through uh, consultation with indigenous peoples in isolation? Yes. In this case, the actions of these control mechanisms allowed for the fact that in the reserve, Madre de Dios, we have not identified any threat because of illegal or unlawful activities. So the coordinated work of protection agents from FENAMAT and the Ministry of Culture guaranteed that protection. Also, our surrounding communities have been able to strengthen on many occasions, 
uh, basic service attention, for example, health services. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, this helped us to act in a preventive way. So we conducted coordination work and also information work mm -hmm. to stop this threat that could have been terrible for peoples in isolation or for peoples who are in rural areas. So this joint work is conducted not only with the health authority, but also with the National Service of Protected Natural Areas. When we identify peoples in initial contact in these spaces, or these spaces require maximum attention. They are of maximum protection. We identify them as such. And the Ministry of Culture guarantees the mechanisms so that these peoples do not face any risks. Thank you, Commissioner Bernal. Would you like to ask any questions? Thank you. I'm going to insist on a point that Clark, Ms. Clark mentioned. Of course, for for this recategorization to be valid, it requires consultation. But there's a paradox if we make contact with the people, but these people cannot be uh, in contact. If I'm not mistaken, there are two indigenous communities participating in this process. I would like to ask the witness to provide more information about that and how the affected communities are represented if they cannot be consulted. Thank you. Yes, the right to self-determination is a right. Is a right that has to wants to be strengthened based on our legislation to guarantee territorial rights. In specific, regarding right to participation, to raise a voice, the organizations that represent as a national level uh, represent the uh, organ the communities that are, are isolated and in initial contact. They participate in the multi-sectoral commission and they have a perspective of protection together with the state so that the PRC peoples are favored by all public policies there are previous uh, studies uh, in order to determine the recategorization to protect the territory in which they live. That is the way in which it has been defined as the principle of no contact. Taking that into account, that's a golden rule that makes us establish mechanisms of representation based on the indigenous institutionality that exists in our country. Thank you. Our special rapporteur, Soledad Garcia Muñoz, is present here today. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President of the Commission. I would like to greet all members of the Commission, the Deputy Executive Secretary, and I would like to ask the witness, which are the measures adopted by the Peruvian state to protect um, communities in isolation in uh, connection with um, business activities? It would be very important for my mandate and for the commission to know about that. 
and in connection with illegal logging that affects biodiversity. Yes, the law PIASI 28736 establishes that these are intangible territories, the ones for of isolation and initial contact. So if something occurs in neighboring areas, there are contingency plans. When there is any finding in connection with this population, these contingency plans are carried out at different levels from the community to different actors that may appear, that may encounter or whether there's a sighting of that community in isolation and initial contact. It's important to say that there is a protocol we have lost the audio. There's a problem with his internet connection. Vamos a esperar 30 segundos. Restablecer la conexión. Let's wait for a few seconds to see whether he can connect. You were concluding your answer. Yes, I'm sorry. There are some problems with my internet connection. There is a protocol, as I was saying, that has been passed by the Peruvian state, according to which uh, there are guidelines and recommendations to any actor that may be related to the people's in situation of isolation and initial contact to reaffirm the principle of no contact with that population. Thank you. I believe that my colleagues have mentioned all the relevant topics. I have no questions and I thank the witness for his participation. In this case, we are going to continue with the final arguments. Each of the parties will have 10 minutes and then there is a possibility of reply for another 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner, the president of the FENAMAD and myself will take the floor. I will now give the floor to the president. I would like to greet the members of the commission. I am Julio Fisirici. Thank you for this hearing. It's about the life and the territories of our brothers, our indigenous brothers in isolation. I would like to talk about the facts in this case. We can see here that the indigenous peoples in at the beach in Madre de Dios, and there have been different sightings and conflicts here. We can see the evidence, for example, we can see the lack of recognition of intangibility of territories of indigenous peoples in isolation. This is in yellow, the reserve. The initial proposal is the one in red. If we move forward, we can see uh, an area of our brothers. This is a territory encompassing um, Brazil uh, to Cusco, Ucayali. That is the territorial corridor of these peoples. And we can see the situation of uh, constant threats and emergencies. 
analysis. It's very important to mention that, taking into account what the Minister of Culture has said, that there haven't been threats, that they have not identified uh, threats by the PSC to the PSC, but we can show that these uh, people uh, received, was uh, heard with um, an arrow by the Piazzi people. Uh, we can see that the threats have continued. And if we look at the roads, these dear commissioners, these roads were um, tracks with good uh are passing by Didi, this is piazzi territory this is what the ministry of culture has said in november 30 2016 the multi-sectoral commission approved the extension of these territorial reserve however in spite of the pandemic these continued and today these bridges, these tracks, and this is the concessions that are in these territories. They say they are intangible, but there are concessions there since 2016, 2013. In 2016, this was approved and in 2022, there was uh, no decree and the impact to these peoples that may lead to a genocide if the uh, Peruvian government does not pass a supreme decree. We show more evidence here. You can see in the signs of these uh, logging concession there's evidence of footprints and these surveillance posts you can see that these brothers come out the ministry of culture has not mentioned there is no agent of protection because um, these indigenous brothers in order to protect their lives come out because this is piazzi territory so that is the evidence the issue of roads in Alto Madre de Dios is another concern. Even uh, oil drilling companies that are located close to these territories. And it's very important to say that there's still more to do, more surveillance posts in other areas, in other basins, around the river and i believe that it's very important to mention but also how the activity this um categorization of reserve with concessions if that is done that's something new there's a territorial reserve for the first time in the world with logging concessions within the reserve and that affects the principle of no contact and of intangibility it affects right to life right to the territory so we believe that this issue should be addressed by the peruvian um, government in not only the Ministry of Culture, that is the governing body in charge of indigenous populations, but that is not the case. Thank you, commissioners. I will now make some comments about admissibility and merits of the case. First of all, in connection with the fourth instance proposed by the uh, Peruvian states, we consider that there's no exception here no, because this exemption is based on complementary elements of the inter-American system, but it requires the existence of adequate and effective mechanisms. Taking this into account, and apart from the constitutional amparo in the internal uh, justice system, 
we can believe that the international uh, justice should take into consideration actions and omissions um, by which the Peruvian state uh, did not comply with international standards, violating the rights of these peoples. The resources should be effective, and the Inter-American Court pointed out that in certain cases, there are not enough remedies, they cannot be exhausted. In this case, it has not been able to guarantee the uh, legal situation of the elect victims in the uh, case. Firstly, before the return from Paro lodged by the Finamad, there is an unjustified delay in the resolution of the process, as this was only based on the admissibility of the case. There was no analysis on the merits and urgency as filed by the petitioners. The judge never uh, made any decisions based on the merits of the case, and the reader from Paro was not taken into account as an urgent remedy, and they get priority to the formality of the civil proceeding in, and did not take into account the urgent protection of the peoples. The relay did not had to do with the uh, complexity, but on the fact that the merits were not taken into account. The unjustified delay of four years we highlight that in that period, four judges um, heard the case and also uh, other cases that had already been heard. There was a delay in the process on behalf of the judicial power. This could have been the solved ex officio. It was not the case. In the first file, we can see that the file was missed. This is from August 10 internal files and a lack of cultural approach, denying requests by Femanad uh, for the case to end with the merits to have an oral intervention. And in spite of the fact that the first instant court knew the existence of a precautionary measure granted by the commission protecting the vulnerable peoples. It is evident that the Peruvian uh, government did not use internal uh, resources and remedies to protect the elect victims. That's why the Inter-American Commission uh, has the power to hear on these events that make evident the violation to personal integrity, judicial protection, equality, and the progressive development of the rights of the uh, peoples. And we will provide further information in written after this hearing. And the petitioner party take into account the arguments that have been presented throughout this uh, hearing and after many years, we request the Commission to declare the admissibility of this case and determine international responsibility of the Peruvian state for the violation of the rights that we have stated. Thank you. Thank you. I will now give the floor to the estates. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. First, we would like to greet the commissioners and the members of the Executive Secretariat of the Inter-American Commission of, the, of Human Rights and also the petitioners and witnesses of the present case. Today, the representatives of the state of Peru includes 14 public officials and public servants that represent the different institutions related to the facts of the present case. Due to the methodology that we will be using in this case, the state will use the time it has to emphasize aspects that have to do with the lack of observance of the requirements of admissibility of the present case. And after that, we will present our position regarding the allegations presented by the petitioners on the recategorization of the reserve and the different mechanisms used by the state to face the threats. And we will send a report in written within the next 30 days and in that report, we'll specify information on forest concessions, hydrocarbon concessions, and also the implementation of a comprehensive health policy. 
Within the framework of the admissibility of the present case, the state of Peru has pointed out through its reports um, the similarities that exist between the petition at the national level through a writ of amparo and the petition presented before the commission. The state of Peru indicates that the FENAMAT wants to have a merits decision since they do not agree with the decision presented by the first mixed court uh, in charge of the case. Also, they are not in agreement with the decisions made by the National Agricultural uh, Office and the Ministry of uh, Indigenous Peoples. Also, um, the uh, state points out that there is a lot of vagueness in the presentation or the filing of the complaint. The FENAMAT did not pay attention to the request of the first instance court, since therefore the first instance on April 2012 um, accepted or admitted the exceptions and requested the FENAMAT to rectify the omissions in the complaint. And if the FENAMAT would not present or would not recti rectify the complaint, the case would be closed. The FENAMAT did not comply with the request of the court and therefore the proceeding was nulled and it was closed. It's important to highlight that uh, none of the parties presented any um, challenging remedy. Therefore, there was an effective mechanism for legal representatives to claim the rights of the represent of those representing represented and secondly the writ of amparo did not reach a decision on the merits because of the lack of actions by the FENAMAT in the legal proceeding therefore the state is requesting at this hearing that the commission is not a fourth instance court and therefore it should not admit the current case I will explain this later. Now I would like to give the floor to Mariel Gallo, that is a lawyer in the office of the public prosecutor uh, of the public prosecutor office. Good afternoon. Uh, taking into consideration what was presented in the introduction, we could say that the alleged violations by the petitioners have to do with the natural resources of the alleged victims. Uh, according to the petitioners, the state is violating human rights recognized in the convention, and therefore it is the responsibility of the state of Peru uh, to address the situations explained on the slide. Also, the state informed the commission regarding the creation of the Piazzi Commission that is in charge of the recognition of indigenous peoples in isolation and in con initial contact, and also the categorization of indigenous reserves. This commission is made up of different sectors of the state and indigenous organizations such as the uh, Peruvian uh, forest indigenous organization. If the categorization of the territory is considered indigenous, it will be intangible and new concessions will be prohibited in the territory if those activities are against the um, cultural activities of indigenous peoples. Uh, according to our presentation, three proposals were presented in 2017 during the 11th session of the multi-sectorial commission. There were three proposals. Then we, ha we have the proposal of IDESEP and CONAP to exclude the territories of the peoples in isolation, especially when they overlap with the permanent forest or permanent production forest. The second proposal of the Agrarian Development Ministry in the municipalities of Tamboapa and Tawamanu, that is to categorize the commercial activities and forest activities are permitted in some specific areas. And then we have the proposal of the Ministry of Culture that is about conducting forest concessions when those concessions were granted before the recategorization. When those concessions expire, the areas of those 
login concessions are will be part of the Madre de Dios Reserve. The PSC Commission has analyzed these three proposals. In October 2017, it was agreed that this commission will send the questions to the Ministry of Culture. The Ministry of Culture will also present before the PSC Commission a report to determine the way in which the recategorization of the reserve will be conducted. In said report, said report was analyzed by the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights, and it was approved by the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. In May 2019, in another session of the PSC Commission, uh, where the proposal to recategorize the reserve was going to be both, a period of two, three months was granted so that the members of the commission could hold special meetings to evaluate the proposal of recategorization. Then, because of a request of indigenous organizations, in February 2021, the decision was postponed so that these organizations could analyze the proposal of recategorization since they said that they have not enough information for making the decision. After the extension was granted in April 2021, there was another session of the commission, but the session was suspended because the representatives of the indigenous organizations were still analyzing the background information and the documents sent by the Ministry of Culture. In July 2021, another session of the commission was um, scheduled, but it was suspended because the indigenous organization representatives did not enter the online meeting. The state of Peru is not acting in by faith, as pointed out by the representatives of indigenous organizations. The procedure is suspended because of the representatives of indigenous organizations. However, this procedure is still going on. Also, through the Directorate of Forest Monitoring of the Regional Association of Forest, we are conducting different actions to follow up on the situation in order to identify any activities that could affect the forest or the territorial reserves. According to what we have said, we are conducting different monitoring actions on the logging companies in the area. The area will be providing detailed information in its written report. In addition, in order to protect the rights of indigenous peoples um, and the Piazzi peoples living in indigenous and territorial reserves, the state through the Ministry of Culture has established a network of surveillance posts uh, located in strategic areas. These control posts are working because of the work of protection agents. At a national level, there are 55 higher agents. Um, and these agents come from the communities surrounding the territorial reserves. These protection agents have been trained and have the necessary equipment to develop their activities. As it was uh, pointed out, and since we don't have much time, uh, in our reply, we will provide extra information on some of the aspects, and we would like to thank you for your attention, and we are at your disposal for any questions that the Commission may have. Thank you so much. And um, now we would like to ask the petitioners, you will have five extra minutes for your reply. We'll use those five minutes, yes. So first, we would like to recall everyone that the recategorization procedure of the reserve was suspended in 2019 in the 21st session because of the request of the state of Peru. The Ministry of Agriculture proposed a suspension so that the members of the commission could evaluate the implications of the decision, having more information. Also, when the proposal was voted, the indigenous organizations that had a vote in the commission voted against the proposal. This shows that the procedure should be concluded, especially taking into consideration the study conducted in 2016. After the suspension in 2019, the state of Peru did not convene the commission 
during the meeting in March 2021, the proposal was uh, not considered good by indigenous organizations because the Ministry of Culture was not complying with the standards to protect peoples in isolation. Who uh, These people should have been at the center of the discussion. These organizations sent a letter to the Ministry of Culture pointing out their stance in this situation. And also uh, it, they reiterated the need to respect the principles of no contact and intangibility of the territories. No actions were taken in this regard. Also taking into consideration what the state said at several times during the hearing, the multi-sectorial commissions are decisions are taken in majority. And therefore the voice of indigenous organizations is not enough because there are only two indigenous organizations and therefore their participation is not balanced because the state of Peru has several votes because of the different territory organizations. Therefore, it's not about consensus. It's a, a space in which the state has eight additional votes against the indigenous organizations who have only two votes. FENAMAT as a territorial organization has no vote in that commission. Finally, we would like to point out that recategorization procedure for the Madre de Dios Reserve advances based on three proposals. So therefore, there is no awareness on the study conducted in 2016. And this is the technical study that is the basis to advance on recategorization procedures. This study recognized the need to consider or to change logging concessions due to the high risk of extractive companies and their activities in the territory for peoples in isolation. Also, Mr. Velasquez said that the principle of no contact is a standard uh, rule. But at the same time, the Ministry of Culture proposed a recategorization with concessions. And this is contradictory because indigenous peoples will be living with concessions, with companies and their equipment and their people in their territory. This shows that these peoples do not want to be in a situation in which concession companies are present. Also, taking into consideration the report of the ICHR on indigenous peoples and the progressive adaptation of concessions, the proposal of recategorization with concessions will imply the co-living of indigenous peoples and concession companies. This will extend for 20 years because concession companies have still 20 years until their concessions expire. This means a lot of risk for the um, indigenous peoples. That is what we wanted to communicate to the commission. We thank you for your time and we are at your disposal if you have any additional questions. Thank you so much. Now I would like to give the floor to the state for five minutes for their reply. Thank you, Commissioner. We have several questions. We have taken down them and we are going to explain our position. Taking into consideration what the petitioner is saying regarding the threats, what you are say, seeing are attacks not against the Piazzi population, but on the contrary, because these are control agents that are trained and they are prepared to protect indigenous people. So the contact there is because these, con uh, these control agents do not want to confront with indigenous peoples. Also, Mr. Ricardo Curis was asking why, why there is no Supreme Decree. We have said that the state of Peru has been very active 
we have pointed out that several times that the meeting has been suspended by indigenous organizations. We will explain this in written as well. The petitioners, we are talking about the proposal of recategorization with concessions. This is one of the three proposals and this proposal is one of them, but there are other two proposals that could be voted. Uh, the representatives of the petitioners were saying that they have only two votes. In fact, uh, there are 15 members who made up this commission and there are anthropologists of national universities of Peru and there is an anthropologist of another of a private university. So the state is facing not only two organizations, there is a plurality of experts in this important commission. With regard to what Laura Posada was saying, we are surprised by the fact that they are not only they are not making reference to the position of the fourth instance argument and that the remedies that they use are not the appropriate way. And we are confused because uh, they have not exhausted those remedies. We are not sure about what they are trying to say. And also, uh, she points out that remedies should not be exhausted, that has been a delay, and she says that there has been judicial negligence. So doesn't is not that the role of a fourth instance, the evaluation of domestic proceedings. The fact is that the president did not move on because of the mistakes committed by the petitioners. There is a lot of jurisprudence in the commission and in the court to decide on this. Regarding what Laura Posado said in her reply, she talked about the ongoing recategorization procedure. We have the records of those meetings and we will explain in written the reasons why the recategorization procedure was postponed or why the commission decided to postpone this because of the lack of action or because indigenous organizations were not present in those meetings. Also, they lack. They talk about the lack of rigorous action by the Ministry of Culture. We do not share that position. We will explain this in written. Also, we are surprised because we have explained in our presentation in the four in the first four meetings observations on the admissibility of the case, and we have discussed not only merits aspects but also. Um, other aspects of the proceeding and why the case did not reach a merits stage. The petitioner has not mentioned anything in this regard. We will be waiting for future documents in which you address this matter. The proposal on recategorization with concession is one of the three possibilities that exist. And no decision has been made because of the lack of participation of the organizations uh, in the different meetings. As I said before, honorable commissioners, we will send in a report the documents and the minutes of those meetings. We don't have enough time, so we would like to reiterate that anything that has to do with the construction of roads, the hydrocarbon project, the state of Peru has a position and stance in this regard. And we will be sending that information to the commissioners uh, in written. Thank you so much for your patience. And this is the way we are closing our five minutes reply. Thank you uh, to the state. We are reaching the final part of the hearing. We don't have time for a Q&A session, but if my colleagues have questions, you can take them down and you can answer them in written. So I would like to ask my colleagues if they have any specific question, uh, please let me know so I can give you the floor. First, Commissioner Arosemena, and then Commissioner Joel Hernandez. You have the floor. And please, uh, petitioners and representatives of the state, take down the questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Taking into account what the state has uh, informed, I would like to re receive further information by the petitioners regarding the writ of Amparo that was um, lodged and that the court that heard about it granted a period of time, we would like to know about the reasons why 
you and they did not rectify the claim what the um, court was requesting. I don't know if I am saying the right resolution, but in May 2012, there was a resolution and there was no response by the petitioners. I would like to receive further information about that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Commissioner, Commissioner Hernandez. I would like to ask a question to the petitioners and another one to the state. To the petitioners, I would like to know the relation that FENAMAD has with PIASI. In that regard, how do you delegate the mandate of representation when it comes to uh, people's involuntary isolation? And the question to the state regarding the alleged logging concessions that exist in the reserves, that is important to this case. Do these um, concessions exist and what are the protection measures adopting adopted by the state in benefit of the PRC. Thank you. I do not see any more questions by my colleagues. I do not have any further questions. So before concluding this um, hearing, I would like to thank the participation of the Peruvian state and the representatives of the elect victims. I remind the big the parties that they have a period of 30 days from today to present their written observations, as well as the answer to the final questions that were made. I would like to thank all the participants and I adjourn this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon.